marvelous history lesson visually. But Lindy has agreed to come and share some of what she has here with us today. Lindy. How kind and generous of you to applaud for me before I've done anything. <laughs> what lovely people. Clive, thank you for inviting me on a personal level. Thank you for that. I'm so delighted to be involved in this uh, dog and pony show. <laughs> you know, there's many different ways to love history, isn't there? Uh, I remember at uh, another uh, Mormon History Association meeting, one of my favorite classes was called, How, What Can an Old Cracked Pot Teach Us About History? <laughs> and it was all about the vessels, you know, the storage vessels of history, how we can know more about what life was really like through just the storage vessels. And I thought that was fascinating. My particular love is through the clothing, and I express my uh, love of uh, history and of the clothing and, and other accoutrements and details uh, thoroughly <laughs> through my paintings. And at the end of my short presentation, I'll show you one of my paintings, how I kind of uh, synthesize all, all these things to one place. Uh, when I was uh, going to school and was starting to gravitate towards historical illustration, I felt very keenly that if I presumed to portray real people who actually lived and breathed and not fairy tales, then I'd better do it right. I'd better have the integrity to make what was important to them, the ideals of beauty that were important to them, more important than the ideals of, of beauty that are important to me in my modern context. And in some ways, those ideals turned around 180 degrees. And I'll give you a, a quick example. Today, we want our men to look like carrots. We want them to be broad-shouldered and tapered down to, to their feet. In history, the tailoring of a man's coat, dropped shoulders, shoulder seams moved around to the back, high uh, collar that was you know, tailored and padded to, to come up uh, high and then sloped downward. In this manner, <laughs> thank you for the visual, Clyde. <laughs> Uh, all of this was uh, so that men and women's clothing was tailored the same way, so that they had genteel, sloping, weak-looking shoulders, so that they looked like they were more acquainted with the indoors and with books than they were with shovels and the outdoors and the muscly shoulders of a common laborer. Now, does that make sense? That's a, a quick example that maybe can show us how these ideals turn around. I started learning about historical clothing and just a world opened up to me. I think that any way that we can experience history from the inside out, rather than, you know, from our, from our modern precipice, you know, from our modern presentism, you know, and looking back, rather than that, somehow try to experience history from the inside out. And I can think of no better way than the clothing. <laughs> because the clothing was their intimate environment. And unlike today, when we live, we live in a wonderfully modern manufactured world, we can go to Walmart or Kmart, or in Utah, the Walmarts or the Kmarts, <laughs> and pick up a $15 shirt and wear it for a few months and then throw it out. In history, clothing was such an investment. Uh, you didn't go out you know, and get uh, uh, even the fabric. You might go out and purchase the lamb, <laughs> or purchase the flax seed, or the cotton seed and then uh, uh, work it in the several step process until a garment was made. A good new dress was meant to last at least a decade. The last half of which it was relegated to workwear, and ultimately the fabric was used in a quilt or sunbonnet or rugs or so forth. Clothing was an investment. What would it say about us if we all custom made everything we were wearing right now? What would it say about your interests? What would it say about your sewing skills? What would it say about your aspirations? And that's why I find it so interesting that oftentimes in folk art from the 19th century, you'll see the whole family <laughs> lined up in a row and then the, the mother uh, seated uh, uh, and holding uh, in her hand some sewing accoutrement. Uh, what she was saying in not a subtle way was, I did this. <laughs> I clothed all of my children with my two hands and my skill and my ability. And I think that that's something that unfortunately we've lost. But again, we can experience history from the inside out. Can I show you a couple things real, real fast? Because uh, today's presentation is all about visuals. And I think it's fascinating to see authentic clothing. 
uh, everything that I'm wearing is reproduction. But everything I'm going to be showing you from in here is authentic. This is a child's dress, probably from about 1870. And it's a fascinating little dress. I love the box pleats in the back. Isn't that wonderful? Beautifully made. Unfinished. The pockets are just pinned on and the collar isn't finished here. There's only a handful of explanations for why a dress would be made like this so nicely and then unfinished. Probably the most um, credible is that this child died in the manu during the manufacture of this dress and then it was set aside and, and, uh, and never finished. It's uh, interesting, isn't it, the uh, underwear of the 19th century. It's hard for us to relate to. I read somewhere that our, our, the equivalent of our underwear weighs something like a tenth of <laughs> the underwear of a, of a woman of the, of the 19th century. We wonder why they did it. It was a tradition. They enjoyed it. They hand washed all their clothes, so they enjoyed their underwear even when they washed it. It was a woman's secret to have beautiful underwear. You saw it also in the stockings. Oh, oh, forgive me, I don't have the visual <laughs> for that. I have dreadfully modern shoes and stockings on. <laughs> but in the clocked stockings of the 19th century, clocked meaning a beautiful embroidery going up the stocking, was never shown, ever. Only two intimates. And that was the point. It was a woman's secret to have beautiful underwear. It was Victoria's secret mm -hmm. to have beautiful underwear. And there was a psychology about history that what made you most alluring, your beautiful hair down and brushed, your underwear, your top stockings, and so forth. There was a time and place for that. And that's in your boudoir at midnight on Christmas Eve, you know, and not just out flaunting it for all the world to see. It's a psychology. See how that's turned around? You know, today if you have a girl flaunted, right? But in history, the things that made you most alluring, you kept, kept intimate. Um, I find this to be a fascinating little, little dress. This is a little child's dress. Now, children's clothing changed much slower than adult clothing. Adult clothing changed quickly, you know, as quickly as fads came in and out. Children's clothing didn't. It stayed pretty much the same, almost all through the, through the century. And red was always used for children. Red shoes, red dresses, and, and so forth. Red was considered a very powerful color, a very alluring color, typical color. And as such, it was somewhat rarely used in a full dress. Now, this is not red, as you know. This is a tertiary color of cranberry. But bright red was saved for small things like ribbons or a, a trimming in a hat. Uh, but not usually, usually not for a full dress. There were exceptions because when you're dealing with clothing, you're dealing with people, not things, right? Clothing is their intimate environment and their expression of themselves. So there's certainly exceptions. But always with children, you see red used because red was, in children, was not a sexual threat. It could be used, you know, and was thought to be very beautiful and very appropriate for children. This is a uh, authentic from about 1860 uh, bodice uh, from the uh, Civil War period. One of the ways that we can identify it as being from this period is the military styling on it. Whenever there was a war, <laughs> there was military styling in not only the men's but certainly the women's clothing. And you see that resonate again and again in the War of 1812, during the Revolutionary War, during uh, even uh, World War II, you see these military you know, type styling. Uh, the last thing that I think I'll show you quickly here, and I suppose I'll use myself as a, as a model. Uh, hair was considered a powerful augmentation of a woman's beauty, and as such it was kept controlled, coiffed, and uh, smooth. Having loose hair implied being a loose woman. So as such, as an element of modesty, it was kept covered by a day cap the first half of the 19th century. It was uh, inappropriate, really, to even receive visitors in your own home without a proper cap on. The women literally bathed with their caps on. Washing body day was different from washing hair day. And they were very good. They took a bath once a month, whether they needed it or not. <laughs> now, suppose you're going out to a meeting or going out to, to, uh, to visit out in town. Well, then, of course, you'll put on your shawl and shawls were worn much more than, than coats. Uh, you still saw some Spencer jackets and so forth. But wrap up, wrap up the grandmother's 
called out to the granddaughters, uh, put on your shawl and wrap up. And also it was considered proper to put your bonnet on, oftentimes right over your day cap so that you would be properly dressed. Now, when we look outside and see that it's a nice sunny day, we, uh, we think to ourselves, well, uh, you know, I'll take off as much as I dare, <laughs> you know, be free and uh, cool and so forth. When they looked outside and it was a bright sunny day, they put on as much as they could. <laughs> they put on their big, big brim sunbonnets and their gloves and so forth because they wanted to keep their skin nice and white and pale. Because again, they didn't want to be you know, like us. We, we want to have a nice, you know, tan. Uh, you know, a nice active looking tan. In history, again, you didn't want the, the bronze skin of a common laborer. So, what do I do with all of this information <laughs> and all of this love? I am so grateful that I can paint. <laughs> if I couldn't paint, I'd have to figure out some, something else to do to show my love of history. But I'm grateful that I can kind of synthesize all of these ideas and ideals uh, in my paintings. Now, I've been fascinated for some time. Thank you, Clive. And this is my husband, Randy. Isn't he adorable? He's <laughs> so kind to come today. Uh, I've always been fascinated with the idea of a quilting bee. It was a wonderful social outlet for women of, uh, of history. You can imagine what a beautiful marriage of form and function <laughs> it was that they could gather together and uh, work and enjoy each other's company and gossip and uh, catch up on, on uh, uh, it was therapy. <laughs> it was therapy to, to meet together and be able to work together. Now, in order to keep a home in the 19th century, you had to have at least a dozen quilts. I'm not sure exactly why, but in a few places I've read, you had to have at least 12 quilts in order to keep house. So a young woman would, in her dowry, in her trousseau, would make the quilt tops uh, from the time she was a young girl to uh, her engagement. And then before her engagement, a series of quilting bees would be organized so that uh, she can uh, uh, have uh, the beginnings of all the bedding and so forth that she'd need for, for her new home. Uh, this particular quilting bee takes place in Kirtland in the mid-1830s. So the styling of the dresses and the other things that you see are proper to the 1830s in Kirtland. Particularly the uh, pattern of the quilt, it's called a Rose of Sharon quilt and it's an applique pattern. Would probably be only one quilt that a woman would have that would be this nice, a middle class, for a middle class woman would, would, that would have, that would be this nice, this applique style but it was madly popular in Ohio in the 1830s. If you ever want to make a quilt historian swoon, just say Baltimore Ava quilts of the 1830s. <laughs> they will uh, know exactly what you're talking about. They were a real zenith uh, of quilting at this, at this time. Uh, there's two sets of sisters, uh, the Smith sisters, the Fielding sisters, and two very good friends, Emma Smith and Elizabeth Ann Whitney. And Emma's little daughter is crawled a, a underneath the quilt. Oh, oh, you know, children grew up under the quilt frame, didn't they? It makes a great fort, <laughs> doesn't it? And uh, uh, Solomon Smith, a little uh, child here. Thank you for holding that up and uh, letting me show that off. Uh, before I finish,